Well, I'm going to transition us now to our message time, and I'm super excited for our guest speaker this morning. He's somebody uh, that most of you will recognize, but he's somebody super important to me. Uh, this is the guy who helped bring me to Cedarbrook and has been a mentor of mine for the last 11 years uh, and a really good friend as well. He's our founding pastor and a great friend. Will you please welcome Pastor Remy? Hey, good to be here. Kyle, I was thinking about our friendship, and I was thinking about the fact that we got together for coffee every Tuesday for 10 years. Do you know we, that means we've shared over 500 cups of coffee together? How crazy is that? <laughs> so it's good to be here. I, I, uh, the last time I spoke in this auditorium was in March of 2020, and I remember it very clearly. We had been out of the country for six weeks, and we came back, and I think I spoke on the 7th of March. And that's just when COVID was kind of hitting the news and some churches had already shut down. And I remember saying, I think we're going to meet next week, but after that, I don't know. And then so we did meet the final week and the attendance was half what it had been on the 7th. And then I said, I think this may be the last one. Stay tuned, look at the newsletter. And then we obviously we shut down. And then Kyle and I were chatting on our Tuesday morning coffee and about when we thought we'd be able to open up again, and Kyle, being the eternal optimist that he is, he goes, oh, I think like two, three weeks, like Easter for sure. I go, I don't know, Kyle. I said, this could go on a lot longer than you ever think. I said, I bet you I may have already preached my last sermon as a pastor at Cedarbrook Church. And he goes, no, that's not, that's not possible. I go, well, we'll just see. I won the bet. I won the bet. Next cup of coffee's on you. Yeah. We continue to uh, share coffee, only it's through Zoom. So every month we get together and talk, and I, I love it. Uh, that was one of the, my joys of working here, is just working with Kyle. So thanks, buddy. Uh, let's see, I want to say one other thing before I start. Um, some of you know that we're going to be going to, we have a really crazy schedule, and it's getting less crazy because we've already done a lot of things. So now we're down to the next uh, three months. We're going to go to Mexico for three weeks, and then we go to Chile for a month to encourage some churches. Mexico, the first trip to Mexico is for a language school. We keep plucking away at Spanish. And then we're going to go to Chile for a month to encourage a couple churches down there. And then we're going to, on the way home, we're going to stop in Mexico City for a month and encourage the churches there. We've uh, established some relationships. So we're looking forward to that, and uh, that's coming up in a few weeks now. But I'm here today because Pastor James asked me to kick off this new series of his called Over It. You know, we often hear people say things to us like, why don't you just get over it, right? It's often, it's often said in a very accusatory, kind of condemning way. But I just want to let you know that that's not James, Pastor James's intention here in this series. He wants to help us get over the problems and the obstacles that are facing us. There's a lot of them, Right? I mean, we all face different things at different levels of seriousness. It might be a dead-end job that we struggle with every week. It could be a tension-filled marriage. It could be uncontrollable kids. It could be chronic pain that you're struggling with or never-ending depression or ever-increasing debt. I mean, to take this off the charts, there used to be a couple that was here years ago. They've moved out, out of state, and I've kind of tracked them a little bit on Facebook. And I know they had a son who was struggling with cancer, and he just died. 20-year-old son died of cancer. I mean, talk about having to get over that. I mean, that's what a, what a gut check. So we're, we're all dealing with something at different levels. We all have to figure out, how do we do this? How do we get over these things that confront us and weigh us down and overwhelm us? Well, there's a story in the Bible that I love and I refer to a lot as I face my own problems. And it gives us a lot of practical principles, and I'm a very practical guy. I love to know the steps to do, how to do stuff to get over stuff. And so that's what we're going to look at today. We find this story in the book of Samuel in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel. And Samuel tells the story of King Saul. King Saul was the first king of Israel. And he faced the Philistine army all the time. They were just always coming at him, causing him a lot of problems. They were a formidable opponent. And Samuel said that the Philistine army showed up with 3,000 chariots and as many troops as the sand in the sea. 
Can you, can you imagine that? Can you imagine coming over a hill, wondering, you know, what's over, how big is the army, and you, and you see 3,000 chariots, and as many, people from left to right, as far as you can see, and as far back as you can see, it's just filling the whole landscape. And sometimes, if you can get that picture, sometimes that's our picture. That's how we feel about our problems. They, they overwhelm us. They outnumber us. And we might respond very much like the Israelites did. Let me, let me read it to you. It says, When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, what did they do? They hid among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of, of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. It's really a pathetic situation. Some hid, some ran away, and the rest just stood there in fear, paralyzed. Saul and his army were totally demoralized. And then adding insult to injury, it says that the Philistines sent out troops every day to raid and to terrorize different cities. You can read that in chapter 14, 13. And if you can believe it, it continues on. It says this, it says, On the day of the battle... Not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his, Saul and his son Jonathan had them. I mean, how, do you fight, how do you fight a battle without a sword? But the Philistines were, were the only one in that day who had the technology to make metal, to make swords. And so the Israelites fought with rocks and clubs against chariots and spears and shields. And again, in the same way, if you catch the analogy here, we are often in that same boat. We often feel overwhelmed by what confronts us. But in addition to that, we're so often terrorized by those daily setbacks that only add to our pain, and we feel totally inadequate to get over them. And so, in a sense, we stand at the foot of a great cliff, and we have no idea how we're going to get over that. We don't feel like we have the tools we need to solve what's in front of us. And so it leaves us hopeless. And some of you might be in that very spot today, and that's why God brought you here. Chapter 14 describes the situation like this. It says, Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Migron. With him were about 600 men. Not exactly the picture of a battle-ready army, is it? It sounds like they were just waiting for the inevitable attack and then defeat. So what do you do? What do you do when you're overwhelmed like that? Maybe you procrastinate, just hoping that the problem goes away all by itself. Or maybe you numb yourself by drinking too much or sleeping too much. Maybe you disappear in the moments when people who know you and love you and need you the most, you just disappear, you vanish. Or maybe you just get depressed and you brood about everything. Just you walk around with a dark cloud. So so what do you do? How do you get over this? How do you get over Saul's pomegranate funk? Well, enter his son, Jonathan. Jonathan, in contrast to His father, he was a man of action. And so we're going to see what he did. Jonathan refused to curl up under that tree in the fetal position and let the Philistines roll over him. He didn't like hiding from the enemy and sitting under a pomegranate tree like his father did. And that was was humiliating. Imagine a warrior curling up under a pomegranate tree. He said, I'm not going to do that. If I'm going down, I'm going down fighting, even if I'm the only one who fights. Now, this is where it gets interesting, and if you're a note-taker, this is where you might want to pull out some notes and, and write down some of the things that we're going to learn here because there are seven principles that we can learn from this story that we can draw on as we face our own problems, as we face our own situations. So as I walk through the story today, if, you haven't already, if it hasn't already come to mind, just grab a hold of that problem that is confronting you and, and think about it. Think about how all these points apply to your situation because who knows, maybe... Maybe you'll walk out of here with a solution. Maybe you'll walk out of here with a new direction for your life. Okay, the first thing we learn from Jonathan about getting over a problem is 
that it begins with a simple idea. A simple idea. Samuel tells us this. It says, One day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his younger armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. So this is a side operation of his. He was doing something that no one else even knew about. Jonathan looked across the the valley to the Philistine outpost, and with a a bit of a twinkle in his eye, he turned to his armor bearer, that, that guy who had got to carry the heavy shield and the heavy sword, and he said, hey, I got an idea. I got an idea. It's that simple. You know, one minute, he was frustrated, spitless, just disgusted with his father for, for losing hope so fast. And the next minute, he was filled with hope because, all because of an idea. He got an idea. And I'll never forget the day that Pastor Kyle came into my office with an idea. I shared this when I was here a few months ago, but I'll share it again. It's a good story. He was frustrated with the fact that we were doing so many fundraisers in the church and we'd do like bread, bread, bakes, bread, bread sales out in, the, out in the lobby. And he said, Remy, it just it takes up a lot of space and it just it makes people feel like we're always asking for money and I don't want to do that. And so he's thinking about it and he's thinking about it and he's thinking about it and he came to my office when he says, I got an idea. And I go, oh, great. He has lots of ideas. Here we go. What is it? We're not going to do any more fundraisers. Just over a three-day weekend, we're going to raise $50,000. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right. $50,000 in a weekend? It's a crazy idea. But, you know, sometimes that's what our frustration does. If, you know, you can, you can let your frustration lead you to despair and get depressed about your situation, or it can lead to a solution, and that's what Kyle did. He, he allowed his frustration to give him a new perspective, to think differently, and out of it came a simple idea. So it started as a simple idea, a crazy idea, really an idea that I didn't think he was going to be able to pull off. But God showed up, and he's kept showing up every time you guys do Mission Impossible. So it turned out to be a very good idea, and that's just how God often works in our lives. He, he gives us a simple idea, and then it grows into something significant. Now, my second point is that our idea, that simple idea, starts out as just a hunch. It's just a hunch at first. What I mean is, our idea may or may not be from God. We don't know. We can't be so sure at first. So we have to proceed with caution and, and just kind of hold that idea open because we don't want to cling to it too quickly in case it's not from God. And look what Jonathan said here. He said, come to his armor bearer. Come, let's go over to the outpost of those godless men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. And I love that word, perhaps, because it tells me something. It tells me that John was basic, Jonathan was basically saying, look, I don't know if this is a God idea or my idea. I don't know if, it, if it's pure wisdom or pure foolishness. But it seems like a pretty good idea to me. And so let's check it out and see if God's in it. What have we got to lose? Some people call this taking a flyer. It's, it's when you say, let's give this a shot. Who knows? It, it just might work. And in fact, that's what happened when we built this building. Because the problem that we were facing is we were running out of space. We were meeting in the, 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 uh, the mall, and we were running out of space, and so we thought, well, maybe we should build. But the problem with that is it was, the idea came during the middle of the 2008 recession when no one was building anything. Every, everything started getting shut down. People lost their job. People lost their retirement and all kinds of things. But we said, I don't know, maybe this is a God idea. Maybe this is the season. This is the moment that we need to do that. And so we said, let's, let's take a flyer. Let's see if God is in this. Let's ask the people and let them decide. Let's not us decide. Let the, let's let God and the people decide. And obviously the decision was let's build because that's why we're sitting here today. It all started with an idea. It started with a hunch. And we said, perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. And he did. And he did. So as you face your problem today, perhaps the Lord, the Lord will work on your behalf too. Consider that. He might work on your behalf too. You know, we often reject ideas before we even give them a chance. We pour cold water on the idea out of fear that the idea will, will cost us too much time, too much effort, too much money. We're, we're way too quick to think that our idea is not from God just because it's going to cost us something. But we have to understand that, that every advancement, every innovation, every breakthrough 
it comes with a price. There's always a, a price, a cost to a good idea. But if it's God's idea, it's worth it. It's worth it. Well, the third lesson Jonathan teaches us about getting over a problem is that it requires a rock-solid faith in God. Let's listen to what Jonathan said. I'm repeating the first sentence. He said, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. But then he says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. That's a statement of faith. Jonathan's like, hey, if this idea is from God, then we've got this. This is a done deal. This is money in the bank. We don't have to worry if it's going to happen or not because God is going to be with us. See, Jonathan knew God. He knew God's character. He knew that God was a God who parted the sea and he raised the dead. He knew that God was a God who called Gideon to face the same Philistine army, but with only 300 men, and they won. It didn't matter that they were only two of them, Jonathan and his armor bearer. The only limiting factor to their mission here was their faith. And Jonathan, I think he had enough for the two of them. I think this is the attitude that we need to have as well when we face our problems. A bad marriage, bad finances, a significant loss in our life, whatever it is, all of those are nothing in the face of God. Because God's all-powerful. He can provide a way where there, where there is no way. Jonathan wasn't afraid to believe God to do great things in his life. And I think we need to be the same way. The fourth lesson in getting over our problem is to be convinced that God will give you the support you need to do it. Now, I love the armor bearer's response here. When he heard Jonathan's idea, he didn't scoff. He didn't laugh and say, no way, Jose, not happening. He didn't say, that's the dumbest idea I have ever heard. You're going to get us both killed. He didn't do that. He said this. He said, do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Man, I love that. I'm with you, heart and soul. And so this guy wasn't a wet blanket. He had the God-given ability to see the same possibilities that Jonathan did, and he encouraged him to do it, and he was going to be with him the whole way. Everyone needs someone like this in their life if, if they want to get over their problems. You know, I'm so thankful to have had many people like this in my life. I've had some great successes, but it's not because of what I did. It's because of what God did. And what God often did was bring great people to work with me. And a lot of you are just sitting in front of me right now or online, Lisa being one of them. And so as you face your problems, you need to understand that that you've got supporters They might be sitting right next to you. It might even be a stranger, but you've got supporters here. That's what church is all about. At least that's what church should be all about. I know a lot of people come to church, come and go, and they take it like it's a personal, um, for personal betterment, and, and they never get involved in the community, but the community is what church is. Church, you know, I've, I've said this for years, but church is not Sunday. It's not, it's not songs. It's not a sermon. It's the community. And if you're not engaged in the community, you're missing out on so much that God has for you. So there's a room full of supporters here, and that's why Cedarbrook and other churches are offering small groups all the time. It's not just something to do. It's not not a time waster. It's something to fill your time. But God wants to encourage you and support you through other people. He didn't make us to go it alone. Now, Before I move on to the next point, I just want to say that some of you may not be going through a hard time right now, and that's great. Praise God for that. I hope that's true for you. But I want to encourage you, if that's true, if you're in a better place, then be the best supporter of the people in your life that you possibly can. It's so easy to self-indulge and to say, hey, I've got it good. Too bad for you. Uh, I'm happy. But look around. I bet you there's people hurting that you don't even know about, that you might talk to them every day and you don't even know them well enough to know how much they're hurting and you could play a significant role in their life. Your words of encouragement might might be exactly what is needed in their life to put your friend or family member over the top. Your support can make them and and if it's not there, it can break them. So I hope you'll look around. Next thing I see here is that getting over your problem requires God's guidance. Let's keep reading here. Chapter 14, Jonathan said, 
Come on then, we will cross over toward them. He's talking to his armor bearer. And let them see us. If they say to us, wait there until we come to you, we will stay where we are and not go up to them. But if they, they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So Jonathan's no fool here. He didn't quote Bible verses and claim a victory for the Lord like so many people do prematurely. Yeah, the Lord spoke to me. God told me this. Now, he wasn't presumptuous like that. He didn't talk about God telling him that they'd cross over. No, it was, it, was a, it was a question. It was a hunch. And he was still looking for confirmation. He was humble about his idea and realistic. It might not work, right? He wasn't really sure if God had given him an idea or if it was just his own idea. And he was willing to walk away if it wasn't from God, if he learned that it wasn't from God. But he was confident that God would make it plain to him. And so he asked God for a sign. You know, I see a lot of people who are paralyzed in making big decisions. They don't want to make a mistake, and, and so they freeze up. But that, what that tells me about them and their faith is they aren't convinced that God's personal. See, if you believe that God is personal, you'll have confidence because you know God will show you what to do. I mean, why wouldn't he? If he's a loving father, why wouldn't he show you what to do? Why, why would he want to drop off your radar and, radar and go dark at the moment you need him most. I would never do that to my kids. Jonathan knew that. He knew that he served a good father. So Jonathan asked God for a specific sign to give him the go-ahead on this idea. He, he didn't just run up the cliff and hope for the best. He, he didn't want to do something unless he was convinced that God was in it. Now, I just have to say, kind of a little disclaimer here, I get nervous mentioning this idea of a sign because everyone thinks differently about what a sign is. I think many people are by nature superstitious, and so they go looking for the wrong kind of sign, all right? They look for signs in the clouds, or they look for signs in their horoscope, or they open up their Bible, you know, and close their eyes and at random pick something and, and hope that it speaks to them. I don't think that's what Jonathan did here. I mean, I know he didn't do that. <laughs> and actually, if you think about that, that's, that's voodoo. That, doing those kind of things, it's like hocus pocus. We, we don't want to engage in that. God often leads us through simple, common sense, and practical steps. I'm sorry, I know that's kind of boring. But I think that's the nature, just like a friend would talk to you and, and offer counsel. God wants to show you different things. And how, so how does he show you things? Is it in the clouds? No, I think it's when you seek out experts in your area of concern. When you go see a counselor, when you talk to your pastors, maybe it's through reading a book or talking to people who are successful, who have shown themselves to be successful in overcoming a similar problem. You know, I think if you continue to ask God, God, show me what to do, and then you go out and you start talking and reading and doing these things I just mentioned, like slowly the fog will lift and an, an idea that you have will become clarified and you'll know what to do and you'll even know when to do it. Okay, the next lesson about getting over a problem is that it requires action. At some point, it's going to require action, and that's where a lot of us stumble, isn't it? We're great until, until it comes to pulling the trigger. We aim, and we aim, and we aim, but we never pull the trigger. You know, we're more like Saul. We find that nice pomegranate tree to sit under and think about it, and we might... Uh, just hope that it's going to magically go, go away if we sit under that tree long enough. We think about taking the action. We might even tell other people what action we're going to take, but then we see the lazy boy in the TV and we, well, what do you know? We forgot all about it and never did it. And another month goes by, another year goes by. But let's keep reading here. It says, so both of them, <clears throat> Jonathan and the armor bearer, showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes they were hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted to Jonathan and his armor bearer, Come up to us, and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. So Jonathan, he got the confirmation that he was looking for. He got the green light from God. Like, yep, that idea, it was a God idea, and now he's going to make this happen. But notice what he says here. He said, The Lord has given them into the hands, not of Jonathan, but into the hands of Israel. In other words, Jonathan took action based on what God 
had already done. This was a done deal. This is something that God had done in the heavenly, so to speak. It just needed to be walked out and just needed to be fulfilled by Jonathan and his armor bearer, and everyone was going to benefit as a result. Jonathan went up, went up that cliff confident that God had gone before him and was with him. See, this effort that they were taking, this, this climb, was much bigger than these two guys, and Jonathan knew that. It was totally dependent on God's involvement. It's, all these stories in the Bible, they're God's stories. Sometimes we, we put too much emphasis on the individual. It's a God story worked out through human beings. So Jonathan understood that his success involved working with God. Jonathan took action, but it was God who went before him. And that's the same for you and for me, right? God isn't expecting you to solve your problems. He wants to go before you and he wants to work with you to give you the power and the encouragement and the direction, the guidance to make it happen. Okay, let's see what happened next. It says that Jonathan climbed up using his hands and feet with his armor bearer right behind him. The Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed and killed behind him. In that first attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. So this is how, you know, these are the steps. This is the fulfillment of these steps I've been ticking off for you. This is how Jonathan and his sidekick got over the cliff and defeated the enemy. And so let me ask you, what are the cliffs that you stand at the foot of today, looking up, feeling overwhelmed and underpowered, but maybe God is asking you to say, climb that hill. I want you to climb that hill because I've given it to you. I've given you this problem. You're going to solve this problem with my help. What enemies is God asking you to defeat? You know, my guess is is that everyone here is facing something. And if you aren't today, you may tomorrow. You never know. Maybe you've been ignoring your problem and hoping it's going to go away. And maybe... My message today is just a challenge to say, you know what, it's probably not going to go one way unless you do something about it. So maybe it's time to take action. Maybe it's time to not only aim, but to pull the trigger. Maybe 2022 is the year of action for you, for a lot of people. It's the year of getting over a problem that's been plaguing you for a long time and weighing you down. Now, we already saw what Jonathan did. Let me finish the story by showing you what God did because, like I said, it's a God story, so we want to see what God did here. It says, Then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and field and those in the outposts and raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Saul's lookouts at Gibeah and and Benjamin saw the army melting away in all directions. They found the Philistines in total confusion, striking each other with their swords. Those Hebrews who had previously been with the Philistines and had gone up with them to their camp went over to the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, They joined the battle in hot pursuit. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel. See, Jonathan took action. When Jonathan took action, God took action. That's that's just how it often works. God's kind of waiting for us to make the first move. And when when we move, that's when God says, okay, if you're in this, I'm in this. If you move, I'll move. But if Jonathan had never acted, if he had just remained under the pomegranate tree with his father... God's power never would have been unleashed, and it would have been a totally different story. I don't know, maybe, maybe 1 Samuel would have been the last book in the Bible. And notice here in my last point that when Jonathan succeeded, everyone succeeded. His efforts benefited everyone. That's what happens. When you get over it, everyone benefits. Not only did Jonathan take out the outpost, God took out the entire Philistine army. And when that happened, it motivated the demoralized troops that were hiding and drew out those deserters from their caves to come fight and overcome the Philistine army. What that means for you and for me is that when we get over our problems, other people benefit. We are going to offer more to our family when we get over our 
problems. We're going to offer more to our workmates and our schoolmates and our church members and our friends. But if your problem is always hanging over you, if it's always weighing you down, you aren't going to offer all these people your very best self. And don't you want to do that? I think you do. You want to offer the very be- your very best self to the world. God didn't create us to hide under a pomegranate tree. Well, I love this story. Like I said, I, I've used it in my own life as I tick down what do I need to do as I face my problems. But really, this story isn't about Jonathan 3,000 years ago. It's about you. And it's about me. It's about all of us. It's about this church facing our problems, facing our cliffs. What are we going to do? Are we going to see the cliff and walk away, not even asking God for an idea? Are we going to allow God to call us up and get over it? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for Jonathan's example. I'm excited at the thought of everyone here finding your strength and your courage to face their problem and get over it. So I ask this for everyone here and everyone watching online in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.